today. My name is Jolene Olson. I am a partner and the administrative director for the Factor Service. Peter is going to start off with a few discussion points. Then he'll follow up with the live questions from our members. So if you have any questions for Peter, please write them in the comment section on the right-hand side of your screen. I would like to welcome Peter. Okay, super. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks everybody for, for being with me. I, I know that we're taking time out of your day and I want to be respectful of that, but I, I want to at least be careful and, and slow in going through the information I'm going to present so that I can make it as understandable as possible. I, I mean, just really what I'm trying to do here uh, in the next three plus years uh, before I hang up my spurs is be able to share as much as I can on trading strategy and, and what I've learned by making mistakes as possible with you all. Uh, I've been at this game for a lot of years, starting in 1975. That's one heck of a long time to make your living on trading. And they haven't all been great years, but uh, for the most part, they've been winning years, and uh, uh, I've enjoyed, I've immensely enjoyed uh, trading, and uh, I, I will I will attempt to share all the things that I possibly can in, in the next couple of years anyway. So uh, I want to go through a couple items first and, and, and just cover them because we get all kinds of questions on them. And, uh, they deal with sizing and order entry, how I enter orders, how I size orders. Uh, and then once I put a trade on, uh, just some simple principles on trade management. And so uh, I want to attempt to do that here. And, and, and let's just start off looking at it this way, that the assumption that I have going into a trade is that there is a highly recognizable chart pattern, preferably 12 weeks in duration. Why 12 weeks? I, it, it just has ended up being that way. I found that patterns under 10 weeks tend to be, uh, tend to morph, not be reliable. Patterns uh, much more than a half a year also tend to be a little bit difficult tactically to trade. And that 12 to 20 weeks for me has just uh, been my sweet spot. And that may be different for everybody. But uh, the assumption is I can find a pattern that's uh, approximately that length, that it's a horizontal pattern. And hopefully uh, enough of you have, have, have read enough about what I've written on horizontal patterns versus diagonal patterns to understand what that means, that it's a pattern that's not subject to uh, you know seven different uh, alternative interpretations, but it's a pretty clear-cut pattern. And... I, I can kind of claim and say, this is what we're looking at. And that it is a pattern whose boundaries are created by real range bars and not candlestick spindles. While I look at candlestick charts only because they stand out better for me. It's not that I'm a candlestick guy and know a lot of candlestick principles, but candlestick charts are a little easier to look at. Um, and so, uh, but I, I, I don't want to be drawing boundaries off of candlestick spindles. Long spindles create havoc in terms of trading tactics. That I enter uh, markets during daytime trading hours uh, when I'm using stops except for highly liquid markets. I do not carry stop orders in the overnight markets. They are subject to be run. Uh, by the high frequency trading operations, they're, they're subject to be manipulated. And so I want to make sure that I, I, I'm trading daytime hours, except for some very highly liquid markets. Uh, and, uh, and, and, that, and there aren't very many of those. That my entry is made with an intraday stop, uh, a, a close only stop, or a combination depending on some other factors. You know, I am a multi-contract trader. And so I tend to, if the pattern's right, put half on intraday, half on on a, a confirming close. And uh, that's, uh, that's my strategy is uh, uh, if I'm taking an 80 basis point risk, uh, which is kind of my standard 80 to 100 basis point risk. And then I adjust that based on an adjustment grid, which is available to you all in the, the archives. But let's say I'm taking an 80 basis point risk trade. 
which means on a million dollars, I'll risk $8,000 or another way to look at it, uh, $100,000, I'm risking $800 on the trade. Uh, I'll tend if I'm taking multiple contract positions to put a 40 basis point risk position on intraday, wait for a close and put the other 40 basis points on unless the market runs away from me and uh, then I have to kind of reappraise that. In terms of breakouts, uh, I, Edwards and McGee uh, in their book say that a valid breakout occurs when the market penetrates a boundary line by three percentage points. So a $100 stock or commodity has to go to 103 on a breakout. Uh, that's just a huge amount. I, I'm not willing to wait for, you know, a 3% breakout on, on uh on gold at its present price, you figure out what it is. And I'm waiting for gold to move $35 past the boundary line to put a position on, I don't think so. So I've generally accepted a one half percent of value to 1% value as a breakout point on an intraday stop, meaning that on a $100 underlying item, I, I'll have an intraday stop at uh, 100.50. In the case of uh, wide-bodied bars, and, and hopefully you know what I'm talking about on that, uh, you've read in my book, I've talked about using the last day rule as my initial protective stop. Well, in the case of a wide-body bar, that's just too much to risk. And so I'll try to find an intraday pivot point for stop protection, initial stop protection, when a market breaks out intraday and when my order is filled, I look at it and, and we've accomplished that breakout with a wide body bar. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple case studies quickly on, on uh, first on Nifty 50, looking at order entry and sizing, and I'll take a look at natural gas on uh, order entry, sizing and trade management, and, and I'll go through these uh, and uh, then I'll open it up for questions. And so let me switch my screen here so that you can see my charts. And first I'll take a look at natural gas. This is a, a market in which I currently am carrying a long position in natural gas. And the, the dominant pattern, which to me is still a questionable pattern, is this uh, enormous possible head and shoulders bottom that goes back into uh, 2014. I, 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 I don't like patterns that are just so big. I tend not to like them. Uh, I, I, again, I prefer patterns that are usually not more than six months to a year. So this is a long pattern. So right away, uh, I have a little bit of question, but nevertheless, it's there. And so it's, it, it's giving me some direction on which to point my car. Uh, it, now, on the uh, look at the December contract. I had called this a, a continuation head and shoulders pattern that dated back to early July and uh, completed finally on October 7th. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was in my sweet spot. It was, you know, 14, 15 week pattern. This was a pattern that uh, I put in an order and uh, entered the order just shortly before the close uh, on uh, October 7th, I was watching the market. Uh, I, I was waiting uh, for a couple of minutes before the close to see if we could close above the key crucial levels back in here around 3.346. And, and uh, I put in an order, it dropped a little bit after I entered it, but I entered it just shortly before the close uh, on October 7th at 3.375. Now, again, based on the last day rule. Those of you familiar with the book, my stop would have been under this low of the same day or under 3.259. Uh, th that would have re represented a risk per contract of, uh, of, of about 120 basis points. And so against the factor tracking account, it was not a risk that I was willing to take, uh, 120 basis point risk. So I had to look for something else. And, and in those cases, I'm looking for some sort of pivot point on, on usually a four hour or a six hour chart. And I'm taking a look then for the last bar before the breakout. And this was, of course, the buy here 
uh, but the last uh, four hour bar before the breakout was his 3.311 pivot point. And so that established my initial uh, stop. And so I go long on the close and I use that pivot point for the stop. Now I am looking on all trades to move stops as quickly as possible. And uh, it, it go back to the daily chart. The next day, the market uh, opened a little higher, broke back down to the breakout point, and then rallied strong, as indicated by the green candlestick bar. And then again, reversing back to the interday chart. This is the break right here uh, that was the retest low. And so then I use that retest low as my next pivot point to protect the trade. And so on October 11th, I moved my stop that just under that level, uh, which was under the 3.355. So I moved my stop to 3.345. Uh, the, the market then drifted sideways. We formed a little flag here for two days. Now I'd never pyramid on something like that, but the market never really put my entry into serious trouble. And of course, today the market broke, uh, opened up about steady this morning, broke hard, and uh, and then turned around and rallied. But we broke hard, and so now I have a new pivot point that I use, and uh, that was under today's low. Uh, and so now my stop is three point three nine five, and so it's under this pivot point. So at this point now, I have a trade that is a break-even trade. And uh, that is really my goal. I will probably move my stop tomorrow to under today's opening price of 3.412. And that will then definitely lock in a profitable trade. And at that point, I'll let the market run. Uh, I have a target of 3.67. Uh, that will represent uh, uh, inadequate profit for me. That'll be a profit of... Uh, uh, of somewhere in the area of, of $3,000 per contract, a little bit less than that. I have a break-even trade, and so at this point, I have a trade that I'm pretty much going to ignore. Um, take a look at the Nifty. Uh, the Nifty on the daily chart is forming an 11-week head and shoulders top. You see here the, the left shoulder, the head, kind of a convoluted break down to the right shoulder low, and then we put in the right shoulder. Uh, today, we, we, we penetrated this boundary line, but we didn't penetrate by uh, the one half of 1% that is required for me, and that's where my intraday stop was. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move over here to the, the, the October contract because that's the active contract, and the entry level, my stop today sat at 85.19, which was a breakout through the boundary line of a half of 1%. It, my risk on the trade, had I been filled, would have been back to this 86.71 bar high right here. Uh, again, I'm not willing uh, to risk it all the way. I wouldn't have been willing to risk it all the way to above today's high bar, which would have been the last day rule, because I'm trying to clamp my risk down as quickly as possible in order to take perhaps a little bigger position. And, uh, and it's, so an entry at 85.19 with a risk initially back to 86.81 would have been 162 point risk or $324 a contract. This is traded at the Singapore exchange in US dollar denomination uh, or on a one contract per 100,000, it would have been a 32 base point risk. So my strategy here, for the factor tracking account is to sell one on an interday stop at 85.19 and then to sell another one if the market can close under 85.39, which would be a clear closing price violation of the boundary line. And uh, that at that point gives me a two contract per $100,000 position with a risk of somewhere in the area of 65 basis points or so. So that kind of takes you through that. And I just want to touch on one other thing, and, and hopefully this is going to run a little longer than we had planned, and, and you can stay with me before I answer questions. But I, I just want to emphasize the long view. You know, the short view is how's my trade going to do today, or how's my trade going to do this week, or 
uh, th that's the short view of looking at market speculation. I want to look at market speculation from a 30,000 foot uh, elevation. And my sole focus on trading is really to keep my closed trade net asset value equity curve from ticking down too much. Uh, I, I really don't pay much attention to uh, open trade profits, especially intraday uh, or even uh, much less on a daily basis because it forces one to be more focused on trading equity as opposed to trading the markets. I want to be focused on trading the markets and uh, I want to move stops to break even as, as quickly as possible and to keep the closed trade net asset value equity line from down ticking while allowing trades to develop sustained trends toward really kind of my sweet spot target goal, which is 300 to 500 basis points uh, profit target in a trading theme. So uh, with that, I'll start uh, answering questions. And Jolene, uh, how do I determine which ones to go to here first? Wonderful. Thank you. I will broadcast the first question for you. We have about 15 minutes left. So if you have any questions for Peter, please write them on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can in the remaining time of your webinar. There you go, Peter. Uh, okay. Uh, where are your soybean oil stops? I'll, I'll just uh, go to December soybean oil. I currently have a position of 15 contracts per million dollars in soybean oil and and uh i'm holding that position and i have stops at 3248 right now and that's under uh this low day uh here on october 5th the market has of course you you know my longer term view of soybean oil and that's we're creating this massive head and shoulders bottom which depending on how i look at the head and how i determine symmetry uh, should break out uh, this week or next, or if it's not, I can calculate it another way and and uh, it may not break out if it is perfectly symmetrical until the middle of December. So wait and see. In the meanwhile, uh, I, I'm long. I'm looking at this, uh, at this symmetrical triangle, which is now a five point symmetrical triangle. And that, that, that's a little problematic and you know, for reasons maybe I'll touch on in, in the weekend update. We have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, actually 0 0.6. Six point symmetrical triangles lose their power. I prefer a continuation four point symmetrical triangle. And so I was hoping the market was going to bust through here. I have uh, stops at, uh, at, at 34, 37 to add an additional 10 lots per million, which will take me to 25 lots per million. Uh, and then uh, if all things go as planned, I'm looking at a close above 35, 50 uh, to complete my trade. My goal is to get the 30 contracts per million on this trade, you know, trades don't always cooperate. You have to adjust your plans day by day, and we'll 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 look and see how it develops. But right now, uh, my stops are under the thirty-two fifty pivot uh, in soybean oil. Okay. Uh, yeah, Tom, when you establish, for example, a long futures position and in intraday price rises to a level where you would add to your position do you add intraday or do you wait for the close to determine if that price holds up for the day i, I wait I, I mean if let's say i'm planning to put a position on of 10 contracts per million of of some of some commodity uh i i will wait i, I will wait to put on uh, if if it's clearly a drawn boundary i'll put on half intraday and then wait for uh, the closing price before I put on the final half. There are some cases where I put on half during the day and the market fails. And it's not unusual when that happens for me to bail out on the close if, if there's enough damage done, uh, even if it doesn't go back to where my initial protective stop was. There are occasions where I will buy a market or sell a market on a breakout and it, I put a half a position on and it fails miserably in a day and I have to scramble out. Okay. Uh, for stocks, Edwards and making confirmation 3% above resistance. Commodities in 4X, uh, yeah, you're right, 3% close extreme for those markets. And so I'm looking at a one half of 1% or a 1% breakout above a key uh, pattern line to determine a breakout. Okay. 
Uh, do I use any other indicators, stochastics, et cetera, to current firm breakouts? Uh, I don't, and let me tell you why. I mean, a lot of those things weren't available when I started trading, and so I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I, you know, if I were to start today, perhaps I would incorporate some of those things. I know there are some useful. I know some excellent traders who I communicate with quite frequently who who use various indicators. I don't, and uh, I, I don't. For a, a, a philosophical reason, I don't for a practical reason. The practical reason is I, I just started trading without those things. And, uh, you know, I, become, I became accustomed to not using those. The, the philosophical reason is I'm sure that I'd confuse myself terribly uh, because there are so many indicators. How, you know, if you have three, four indicators and they don't all line up, uh, you do not take a trade. It just, I think it would complicate my life. There is one indicator that I really do like, and that's the ADX. Uh, the ADX indicator, if we formed a, a big base, big bottoming area, and the ADX indicator gets down into the area of 10 on a daily chart, even better if it gets down under 12 on a weekly chart as well, and then you have a breakout, uh, you, can, you can take that trade to the bank. And so uh, there aren't many of those that occur, but I do like the ADX indicator. I don't look at overbought, oversold. Uh, but the reason is this, grossly uh, obscene bull markets become obscenely overbought and stay obscenely overbought. And so uh, the fact of the matter is, is if I'm along soybean oil, I want the market to get overbought. And the more overbought it gets, the better I'm gonna like it. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you use it works to trigger trades? I have alerts on in every important price that I have. For instance, in uh, soybean oil, I have an alert on at 34, 37. I have an alert on at 32, uh, uh, 47. I, I, I have alerts everywhere. I have alerts in, in soybean oil at 35, 60. Uh, and so any price that w where I have an order that's either working on a 24-hour basis or it's going to go in on a day order, uh, I have an alert in. And I have my alerts both emailed to me and sent by text. And, uh, and, and so when I get an alert, it may trigger a trade. It may not. If I get, you know, I don't, traders... Uh, such as myself get a used to having interrupted sleep and it's not unusual for me to get interrupted by an alert in the middle of the night and i'll take a look at a market and determine whether it's something that i'll go back to bed and wait until the morning for which usually is the case uh it may be obvious that uh an alert was triggered based on high frequency traders running stops it may also be that something's happened and, and it's an actionable alert and I may do something uh, uh, during nighttime hours. I generally don't like trading during nighttime hours because I often don't trust, but you take the yen, the yen's primary market hours are when I'm sleeping. And so there's a case where if something triggers in the yen overnight, it, it, it's an important trigger. Next question. Also, on a very large bar breakout where dollar stop at the beginning of the bar would be too much, do you have any other suggestion to set a dollar stop? It, no, I'm, I'm, I want to try and find something, you know, whether, whether it's the higher low of an hourly bar or if I don't like drilling down the hourly bars, I prefer to look at, uh, I'll look at soybean oil here where we are is, is I, I look at uh, in this case, it's a four-hour bar, or I might look at a six-hour bar. I don't want to drill down any further than that because I think it just uh, it, it, it's, it's getting my nose too close to the screen. And so, uh, but in the case of a big wide-bodied bar, uh, I, I, I would prefer to try to find something on the chart, uh, a little pivot point or a higher low of a four- or six-hour bar. Uh, next question. A brief opinion on today's price action in corn, uh, possible buy level for crude oil. Good question. Uh, take a look at uh, uh, take a look at corn here. Um, it, it, the corn market is, is is corn prices are cheap if that matters, but we've had difficulty here with with the corn market breaking out. It, it's it's been a complicated market. You know, we broke out. 
broke down, broke out, broke down, broke out. Uh, I think today's breakout is a legitimate breakout. I did not go long corn. Uh, I, I, I still have to decide whether maybe I want to buy corn on a bit of a break tomorrow, but I think corn is a it's been a difficult uh, 10 days trying to figure out what corn's going to do because it hasn't really paid much heed to this neckline of the head and shoulders bottom. And I don't like markets that just kind of ignore an important boundary line. It's kind of fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on the market. And I'm, 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 I don't need to make money in corn to make my year. And so if I see a market that just doesn't really pay much uh, attention to the sovereignty of a boundary line, I'll tend to stay away from it. And so uh, I, I doubt if I'll trade corn. I may come in and place an order in wheat. I, I like the action in wheat today. It's a little bit too short of a pattern for me to really buy it. Uh, you know, it's only a six week double bottom type pattern, but um, yeah, that to me is a little bit more attractive. I, I have, I, I doubt, I Doubt very much whether I'll put in an order in either corn or wheat because the patterns are in wheat's too short. The pattern in corn is too squirrely, but uh, I can't argue with somebody wanting to be long corn at these levels, especially with commitment of traders and, and historical price support. Okay, uh, crude oil. Yes, about crude oil. Um, let's find crude oil. I mean, crude oil has this big head and shoulders. Uh, bottom that it's that it's trying to build on on the weekly chart and uh, uh, here it is right here we're right up to the neckline um, I have alerts in I'm gonna look at it I mean I'm looking at this 53 level on the continuation chart on on the December contract uh, hopefully this will be December that's November uh, you know I'm looking at this level up here on 54 and a half. Uh, you know, we'll see when we get there. Uh, the market is closer on the continuation chart to breaking out than it is on the December contract chart. That's usually a good sign. It, when your continuation chart leads your breakout and your individual deferred contracts follow, that's usually a sign of market strength. That's a good sign. And uh, I have alert in. I do not have any orders in. Part of me kind of just doesn't trust this pattern in crude oil, and um, you know, I, I I will probably if it break out by something, but I doubt that it's going to be much more than maybe a fifty basis point trade, only because subjectively I just uh, uh, I have a problem. I, I got positioned well in crude. Uh, but let go of a position too quickly based on the symmetrical triangle in the right, in the right shoulder. And so I'm flat and crude and I, I just, I'm going to play it day by day. Okay. Next question. I've been trading daily bars for a while. It seems like moves almost always fail. If weekly bar does not uh, confirm the move by closing outside the ice line, Peter, have you ever thought about simply entering on a Friday closing basis Win rate would probably be much higher. Absolutely, I, I'm Alex. I, I mean, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I've thought about it. I've I've never really done it, but I've thought about it, and it would be an outstanding way to trade. That if uh, if one has the patience uh, to wait for closing, you have to give the market much more room. Uh, probably take a hundred and fifty basis point risk on the trade because you get much much fewer signals but they're going to be much more dependable uh, and you're going to have to then take much smaller positions. And that's why I don't do it is uh, the position sizing would be a little bit lower than really what I'd want to do it. But uh, would it be a legitimate, a superb way to trade? Absolutely. It would be Alex. Uh, excellent question and excellent observation as well. Next question. Uh, how would I go from cash? How would I go from cash to fully invested? How do you trade many stocks? What if, for example, many stocks you are watching have a buy signal at the same time? To be exact, is there a maximum percentage of total equity you would cap your risk at? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, if I'm giving in the case of stocks, I, I generally trade a 50, 60 basis point position. Uh, the problem with stocks is it eats up my cash so quickly. I, I mean, that's why I like futures is, you know, cash purchases 
the way I trade, uh, I, I probably couldn't afford a fully vested position, which much more than a 10 stock position. And, uh, you know, my, my capital would be pretty much run out. I would, I would not trade with margin. I'd trade fully vested. But if I was just trading stocks, I probably could only be in somewhere 7, 8, 9, 10 stocks at a time, uh, risking 60, 70 basis points. So if I'm wrong on all, I, I'm in a 7% drawdown. So I would just want to pay attention to make sure I wasn't in highly correlated stocks. I would not look at that mathematically. It would just be a, a judgment call on my part on uh, uh, you got the highly related tech stocks and you get two buy signals you get buy signal two I'd probably take the best of the two so okay uh, next question position has been extreme in so many markets recently in the COT do you see a general tend toward increasing speculation that may lead to more false breakouts yeah, I mean, uh, that is, that's a great question, Patrick, and I appreciate the question because uh, the reality is we are, we are seeing COT extremes uh, uh, that are unbelievable across many markets, and and one can can argue that you know, maybe we're in a new era. Maybe you know what traditionally has been extreme positions can uh, can continue. Keep in mind, commitment to traders is a tool. That's all it is. It, for me, it's never a trigger. It's never a timing tool, but it can give me a directional bias. And uh, for instance, in gold, I had a directional bias to the downside. I have a directional bias to the downside in sugar presently. And so it'll give me a directional bias, but it doesn't give me a signal. The question is, uh, do we are we in an era where extremes need to be ignored? I kind of don't think so. I think sooner or later, extremes will catch up with themselves. They have in every market so far uh, to date that I've been watching, except for sugar, uh, they have caught up with the market. And, uh, and, and uh, sometimes it just takes a while. You know, markets that have an extreme can stay at an extreme for quite a bit of time before those extremes finally kick in. And uh, so you always have to combine uh, commitment of traders biases with chart biases for for timing and entry and risk management okay next question uh, yeah I have been watching the, the, the dollar one as a matter of fact it it made uh, the cross made a new high here uh, this week the problem with it is it's uh, it, it's difficult to trade the Chinese uh, the Chinese banks have, have made it a very difficult carry trade. It's a reverse. It's an it's a reverse carry trade because of the interest rate differentials, and uh, and so they've Chinese banks have really figured out a way to devalue their currency, and at the same time keep speculators from cashing in. I, I made money in two of the the first two major legs, and I haven't been involved since, but I've been watching it. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to answer one more one more question that I just see on here, Jolene, and then we'll cut it off. How do I calculate basis point? A basis point, 100 basis points is 1% of capital. So if I'm willing uh, on a million dollars to risk $10,000, that's 100 basis points. And so a basis point is just like it is an in interest rate. A basis, 100 basis points is 1%. Uh, and so it's just an expression of, of risk uh, as a percentage of trading capital. Okay, uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As always, we appreciate you coming and hanging out with us for this half hour or so, and we love that you bring your questions.